Creativity can seem like a magic trick of the mind, but there is nothing magical about it. We are beginning to understand how the trick is done. Imagine how creativity works. It's about our most important mental talent, the ability to imagine what has never existed before. I think people who would be interested in this book are people who are interested in creativity. I think we're all in the creativity business. I think whether or not we know it, we are constantly inventing things, connecting things, mashing up ideas, finding those associations, those, those subtle links. Um, so we do that all the time. We are all in the creative business in a sense. Um, and, and for me, I wrote this book because, you know, as someone who puts words on the page for a living, I wanted to figure out how to do that better. I wanted to get better at putting words on the page. I wanted to have more ideas in the shower. Um, I wanted to better understand this mysterious thing we call the imagination. Um, you know, for thousands of years, we've just been outsourcing it to the muses. And, and that's fine, you know, it's a nice story, it's a romantic story, but, but I think by outsourcing it, we've kind of given up our control over it. Um, and I wanted to take some of that control back. I wanted to figure out, well, how can I have more ideas? How can I use this new science, this new knowledge, to make my imagination work a little bit better. Until we understand the set of mental events that give rise to new thoughts, we will never understand what makes us so special. You know, the, the simplest possible message is simply that the way we've been thinking about creativity is all wrong. I think for too long we've seen creativity as an all or nothing phenomenon. You either have it or you don't. There are creative types and then there are the rest of us, people who are just doomed to repeat the work of others. And I think that's wrong. I think what you discover when you look at creativity from the perspective of the brain is that creativity is universal. We all can create. We are connection machines. We're always trying to connect ideas together. Some people are clearly better at it than others, but we can all learn how to do more of it. Um, and, and what you discover when you look at creativity from the perspective of the brain is that creativity isn't a singular thing. It's not like one spot in the cortex one can point to. Instead, creativity is really a catch-all term for a variety of distinct thought processes. So sometimes you want to relax, sometimes you need a moment of insight, sometimes you need to take that shower. And, and that involves a separate network of activity in the back of the right hemisphere. And, and sometimes, you know, you need to just focus and, and work hard and pay attention. And that involves a different kind of creativity. And sometimes, you know, when you're up on stage, you need to improvise. It's going to involve a different kind of creativity. So, so, you know, creativity isn't just, there's not just one way to create. There's no universal prescription for how to come up with a new idea. What I think the secret to creativity is all about is learning how to think in the right way at the right time. Learning how to diagnose our creative problems. We can say, okay, I get it, I need a moment of insight, so I should actually step away from my desk and go take a long walk. Or, you know, I'm making progress, I should drink some more caffeine, I should chain myself to my desk, I should keep on paying attention. Focus, focus, focus. And, and really try to think based on the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Every creative journey begins with a problem. It starts with a feeling of frustration, the dull ache of not being able to find the answer. We have worked hard, but we've hit the wall. We have no idea what to do next. I think the message is important because, you know, we live in a world of very hard problems. All the low-hanging fruit is gone. Easy problems have been solved. We've invented the easy stuff. We've, we've, we've solved those challenges. So what we're stuck with now is, is is the difficulties that remain, those persistent problems that, that seem impossible. In order to solve those problems, I think we need to really get a better sense of how the imagination actually works. For most of human history, people have believed that the imagination is inherently inscrutable, an impenetrable biological gift. As a result, we cling to a series of false myths about what creativity is and where it comes from. These myths don't just mislead, they also interfere with the imagination. You know, I was really drawn to the mystery of creativity. I think there are few things quite as mysterious as one of those aha moments, those moments of insight, those epiphanies that come in the warm shower, or come when we're walking on the beach, or come when we're lying in bed at six o'clock in the morning. And I was just drawn to the mystery. Like, even when the ideas come to us, they happen to our own mind, we can't explain where they came from. Um, so, so it was really the mystery that attracted me, 
And, and then the fact that our world runs on creativity. This is the essential trait of human nature. We live in a world surrounded by our own creations. Everything from you know, these cameras to those lights to the gadget in my pocket, the clothes I'm wearing, that all requires invention, innovation, creativity. So I wanted to understand that, how that happens, and how we can get more of it. The act of feeling frustrated is an essential part of the creative process. Before we can find the answer, before we can even know the question, we must be immersed in disappointment, convinced that a solution is beyond our reach. Looking back on my own career, it's inseparable from failure. Um, you know, I originally wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a neuroscientist. Uh, I worked in a lab for a number of years. Uh, it was a wonderful lab. I was in the chemistry of memory, and I, you know, it was there over the course of those five years in the lab where I realized, you know, I'm just not cut out for this. I'm not good at the manual labor of science, those day-to-day -day experiments. I think to be a great scientist, you have to love the active experimentation, and, and, and I didn't. And, and so that was a very, di very disappointing failure to me. I, I, here was this narrative I've been carrying around, and I just couldn't do it. I wasn't good enough. Um, and so then that's, that's, that's when after a couple years in grad school, I realized, well, you know, I do miss science. I really love hanging out with scientists, talking empiricism. How can I get back to that? Um, and that's when I had the idea for being a science writer. But, but it very much grew out of my failure to become a scientist. So, so for me, where I am is completely inseparable from what I couldn't do, from all those failures, which of course, failures are always so disappointing. They, they make us so upset. There is no sugarcoating the, you know, the difficulty of a failure, but I think Whenever possible, we have to take the bigger perspective and realize there's no getting around it either. Failure is just part of the creative business. Creativity shouldn't be seen as something otherworldly. It shouldn't be thought of as a process reserved for artists and inventors and other creative types. The human mind, after all, has a creative impulse built into its operating system, hardwired into its most essential programming code. You know, for me, there, there rarely is a big epiphany simply because these books grow out of so many conversations with scientists, with, you know, real creators, whether it's Bob Dylan or Yo-Yo Ma or the guys at Pixar. So, so there's no sudden flash. Um, for me, the flashes tend to be more minor. It's like how to structure a chapter or how to finish a sentence. That's where I feel my aha moments. But, but the idea for the books really emerge over you know, a couple years of research and just, just asking lots of silly, naive questions. When people think about creative breakthroughs, they tend to imagine incandescent flashes. Scientists use such tales to define the inside experience. The first stage is the impasse. Before there can be a breakthrough, there has to be a block. You know, if, you know, if I had one piece of advice for someone with an idea out there, um, you know, it would be that creativity is always hard work. It's always going to involve lots of frustration and failure and, and constraints and roadblocks. There are going to be moments when you want to give up. But that's why creativity requires grit. It requires stubbornness. It requires persistence. It requires people to embrace those failures, to not try to avoid failure, because really the act of creativity is so entangled, so inseparable from failure. I mean, Bob Dylan, as Bob Dylan once said, there's no success like failure. And I think that's absolutely true of creative success. So if you've got an idea and you want to execute, I think prepare yourself for those failures. Realize they are part of the process, that, that your job as a creator is to simply fail as fast as possible, to get those failures out of the way and fix them so that when your idea becomes real, there are no failures left. You have found them all, you have identified them. What you're left with is, is a perfect end result. You know, my expertise is parasitic. My expertise, to the extent I'm an expert and I wouldn't call myself an expert even, um, comes from spending time with people who create for a living, you know, real world creators. So I was fortunate enough to get to spend time with people who I've, I've long loved their work, whether it's Milton Glaser, the graphic artist or Yo-Yo Ma or you know, down the list, you know, Don Lee is an amazing bartender, Clay Marzo, a world-renowned surfer, people who have really created something worthwhile, getting to spend time with them, just basking in their glow in a sense and, and asking them questions. And, and then from spending time in the lab, talking to scientists about their work, trying to understand how they are trying to make sense of these very mysterious phenomena, things like moments of insight. How does one study them in the lab? How does one bottle it? How can one find the neural correlates, neural correlates of an epiphany? 
Um, so, so, you know, those are the people I try to learn from. How do these insights happen? What allows us to transform a mental block into a breakthrough? Why does the answer appear when it's least expected? For most of human history, we've pretended that the imagination is an impenetrable biological gift. How do you know when you have an idea that you really want to move forward with, where you have the sense that it's a valuable idea? Um, you know, how can we sort our valuable ideas from our less valuable ideas, the wheat from the chafe? Um, you know, this is a problem which has bedeviled many creators. I mean, you know, I talked this morning about Bob Dylan, and, and this is you know, one of the great poets of rock and roll. And yet Bob Dylan has produced a few mediocre albums as well. You know, it's like being a successful creator is no guarantee that all of your inventions, all of your songs, all of your novels, all of your sentences, all of your gadgets, whatever it is you're trying to make, that they'll all be good. And, and I think that's, that speaks to the difficulty of sorting our good ideas from our bad ideas. Um, <clears throat> there's an experiment that came out a couple months ago that actually looked directly at this um, question, and it was quite interesting. What they found is that the best way to sort your good ideas from your bad ideas, the really innovative stuff from the less innovative stuff, is to take a break. That too often people will invent something right away, and then they'll say, oh my god, this is a great idea, I gotta execute it right away, I gotta invest in it, double down but they didn't give it enough time. And, and what seems to happen is that when we have an idea and we put it in a drawer for a day, a week, a month, a year, for as long as you can stand it, then you come back to it, you come back with a better perspective, your unconscious has molded over, really come to a conclusion about whether or not it's valuable. So, so the advice of these researchers who, who tried to figure out how people should judge their own ideas was that when in doubt, give it some time. Um, you'll, you'll gain some perspective. This makes total sense to me as a writer, you know. When you write something and you give it an immediate read, you can't really see all the problems with it. You're blind to them. You are reading it, you're too close to it. So you can't see the bad metaphors and the bad adjectives and the excess verbiage. When you come back to it a week later and all of a sudden, all those errors incandesce, you can see them all. Um, so, so this is advice that makes perfect sense to me. So if you're really trying to figure out which ideas are good and which ideas are bad, which sentences you should keep and which sentences you should edit, when in doubt, just wait, be patient. Time is a great cure. Every creative story is different, and every creative story is the same. There was nothing, now there was something. It's almost like magic. I'll keep on writing for as long as they let me. Um, you know, I love looking at the brain and trying to connect the brain to the real world, trying to figure out how all these elegant experiments in the lab and these carefully controlled conditions how we can take that new knowledge, these new facts, these shiny new facts, and apply that to everyday life. That's what interests me, is making that connection. Because I do think this new knowledge is useful knowledge. I mean, you know, it goes back to the, you know, the oracle at Apollo, you know, who said, know thyself. That was their commandment. I think thanks to these new tools of modern neuroscience, we can know ourselves in a completely new way. And I think this is really valuable knowledge. Um, you know, self-knowledge is valuable knowledge because it helps us get more out of these three pounds of meat inside our head.